Did you have an awareness that you were part of a miracle this morning? No, you say amen. Do you know what I'm talking about? This is the middle of hunting season. And you saw five guys with no girls here in worship this morning. That's as close to a miracle in Jackson County as you're going to see in a while. Wow. Family, I hope that you appreciate how God works. Because he doesn't, if you will, throw like you want him to. You expect underhand and easy. God throws you changes in your life. And you sometimes go, oh, I didn't even notice that. One of my favorite things is how people find Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I'm hoping as you're, you've grown older, you realize that, you know, God can work in some really unusual, profound ways. All right? Um, in my heritage here, uh, one man, when I asked him how he accepted Christ as a Savior, he accepted Christ after 10 o'clock on a Friday night, having already taken hallucinogenic mushrooms, realized, uh-oh, and then went and sought out a friend who knew Christ. And the, the miracle is, he remembered the next morning. And it was still sincere, and he still follows Christ. That's, to me, incredibly encouraging. I, I, I love it. We have another one here who was in a gang and as he came up to sell drugs, the cops saw him first. They threw the gun and the drugs out and in the chase that pursued, he escaped. He accepted Christ maybe 10 years ago now and is in a constant source of encouragement to me. God has a way of interjecting himself in weird situations. Now, just so that you understand, I think that God working in unusual ways normally is rather fun. We have a younger man here in the church accepted Christ as his savior because his babysitter, when he was four years old, shared with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And before he fell asleep for his afternoon nap, Accept his Christ as his Savior and has never doubted the information of the gospel from that day on. You see, you don't need mushrooms to have a great testimony. You just need to be aware that God works in unusual ways. And he doesn't plan out what you and I normally think as normal. And so we're going to come today to what you and I see as the day of Pentecost. And I want you to know as we start, it's not a normal day. It's not a normal day. Now, you saw last week that it came with supernatural traction. It came with a flame of fire that stood in front of each and every member of the church. All right? As that tongue of fire came in and then entered into the individual, they began to go out and they spoke flawlessly in the language groups of the people who were here worshiping in Jerusalem. And as they heard it, we saw that they were accused of being drunks. And family, I, I hope you walked away and with a simple recognition is God can do supernatural things through you in a natural way. He works regardless of all of the things that may go on. So today we're going to see how Peter takes that. And as, as God works in God ways, what I want you to see first this morning is that God comes to you. God comes to you. Um, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Sheaths. Family, um, Pentecost simply means 50. 
in the Greek language. So it would have been 50 days after the Passover. You're celebrating now this holiday. This holiday rec recognizes the harvest season. It was much more celebratory than Passover. Passover is a solemn ceremony. This is much more uh, joyful, uh, if you will, both family-friendly and celebratory. Uh, one pastor described it as the Mardi Gras of the Jewish season may have gone a little too far in its, its explanation, but yet much more celebratory than any of the others. So it would have been not necessarily unheard of for the men and women to accuse the people of the church of being drunk when having heard this tongue and not being able to describe it. So it's not the kind of day that you would normally think of as, oh, wow, this is the day that so-and-so found Jesus Christ as their Savior, all right? You and I are going to think of, oh, they found Christ as their Savior. They went to that Billy Graham crusade. Uh, oh, they found Christ as their Savior. Uh, another act of normal. They went to church. Uh, they were sitting at, with a group of Christians. This is not that moment of time. Much more celebratory, much more unusual to see God work in this way. God interjects himself. God always seems to have a way of doing that. And family, uh, conversely, you might be wondering, uh, what does it mean as the church of Jerusalem were waiting upon the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to wait on the Holy Spirit for you right now? I want you to understand, when Peter waited on the Holy Spirit, Peter just started speaking to explain to the world why his believing friends were speaking the way they were. And so he simply just started to tell them, wait a second, they're not drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. We don't act that way this early. We don't do that. And then he began to unpack. So family, when you wait on the Holy Spirit, it might mean that you're doing nothing more than going over and mowing the neighbor's lawn who's been gone for an awfully long time and the yard's starting to get hairy. And in going over there and they come back, it starts a conversation where Jesus Christ can be proclaimed. It may be nothing more than you going over to a home in a risk and you know that that single mom has been burning the candle at both ends and keeping up with a job and keeping up with children, you go over with dinner. And you never know how God uses what God does in your little action. And you may find that the Holy Spirit has been interjected at that very moment in time. You don't know how God will use you as you wait for a time to be used. But family, I want you to understand, as you do, God comes to the individual that needs Jesus Christ as Savior. And as we begin our study today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. We're going to cover a long section of Scripture. And either I want to apologize to you or tell you you're in for a real blessing. Because you're in to hear a sermon about a sermon. So you really get to hear two sermons today. Aren't you lucky? And you don't even have to say, well, you know, now I don't have to go next week. You still do. You'll be out that much ahead. So we're going to hear a sermon about a sermon. And as it starts, I want you to notice, not only does God come to you, but God often addresses your questions. God addresses your questions. And when we find that we've accepted Christ, usually we have a question that we can't quite answer. And God has a way of answering it to break down the barriers for us to see the work of salvation. Here, the men and women who are at the festival of Pentecost are asking the question, what just happened? So Peter stands up and he's going to address the question. Let me tell you what just happened. And in verses 17 and 18, and then we'll skip ahead to verse 20, I want you to see how he addresses the crowd. He's going to be used by God to answer their question. 
It says this, and in the last days, it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. He closes in verse 20 with much more of a darker image. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And family, Peter's talking, if you will, to a Jewish crowd. Uh, earlier in the chapter, they're called the God-fearers. So they knew the Old Testament. So God uses Peter to answer that question maybe far differently than he may have used had he been answering your questions at that time. He says, why are these people speaking like they're speaking? And Peter simply goes on to say, first, coming back to a Old Testament passage in the book of Joel, that in the last days I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit and this has just been fulfilled. But then he closes with something far more ominous, that there's going to be blood, that there's going to be darkness, and the day of the Lord is on its way. And just like a play that has a closing act, the arrival of the Holy Spirit and the day of the Lord are in the same act of the play and we're looking at the beginning of that act and the day of the Lord will be in the closing of that act and many of us who know scripture are waiting for that day but Peter takes his time to answer the question what does it mean for you guys to be speaking in tongues and ultimately he's going to use it to point to Jesus Christ family God typically answers questions that people have in order to break the barriers for the gospel. He answers it here. I want you to understand, I don't know how he did it for you, but let me share with you what he did for me. Um, I'm a 19, 20-year-old kid, and I was raised in the church, and I started to hate the hypocrisy in the church. Man, I could point to so-and-so and their inconsistent life was terrible. And I hated it. You either follow Christ or you don't follow Christ. And I'd point to another one and point to another one and point to another one. And it grew to be very discouraging for me. The church is filled with hypocrites. I don't want to be a part of it. The other thing is, is I'm a why guy. Uh, I never grew up past that two-year-old child who would always go around the room, Why? 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 And it'd drive your parents nuts. Well, I drove the church leaders nuts. As I would ask, why? Why do, why do you do this? Why do you do this? And what I wanted was a solid answer. And I often got, well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, that's what the church does. Well, that's what we were taught by our leaders. Well, forgive me, but when you're a why person, that's not very fulfilling. I want chapter and verse. And if you can't have chapter and verse, then at least give me the application of that chapter and verse as it works out in your life. And I go, oh, okay, that makes sense. But I grew very discouraged. And on the night of my frustration, uh, I was at a church service in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 19, or 19 and 20, were the foundation of the sermon. It says, what? Don't you know? that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? And you've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body which is his. And all of a sudden, the realization that him buying me only had relationship between him and me. Hypocrite there and hypocrite there and hypocrite there and hypocrite there and hypocrite there had nothing to do with my salvation it was between God and me. I bought you with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. And all of a sudden, you realize it wasn't about what the church was doing right or wrong. It was about my relationship with Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, the question that I had got rewritten. And God says, wait a second. Your question's the wrong question. Let me share with you the right answer to the right question. And all of a sudden, 
the reality of the gospel became something that I could easily embrace because the questions were answered. God not only comes to you, but God addresses the questions that men and women have when they need to respond to the gospel. It's not just done on a blank slate. And on t now today, we're going to look at the entirety of the sermon. And so if you will, as I begin, we're going to read verses 14 all the way down to verse 41. I'm sorry, not 14. Uh, we're going to read verse 17 all the way down to 41. And if you will, follow along as I work through them. And I'll get them right. We're going to start at verse 22. Notice what it says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have, been, you have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, every one whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So family, what I want you to see this morning, especially those of you who are part of our church family, those of you who are recognizing we are encouraging you to be reaching out, that ultimately, all opportunities of sharing Christ can be reduced down to the ABCs, to admit that you're a sinner, to believe that Jesus Christ is the only one, to redeem you from that sins and to choose that he is your redeemer and you will live a life in devotion to him. And so the ABC starts really with the very first sermon that we see in the Bible. And I want you to understand whether you're sitting having a cup of coffee at Starbucks or you were able to figure out how to break through the space-time and continuum and go all the way back through the history of the church. Anytime the message of the gospel is offered, 
you can reduce it down to the ABCs. And so family, one of the reasons we're encouraging you to know the ABCs is that you will have a chance to share Jesus Christ. And the situations may differ. The moments may not be the same. But the core information that will transform the individual that you love and are communicating to will always, always, always come down to the simple message of the cross, the ABCs. So if you will, I want you to notice first, God holds us accountable. Admit it. Admit it. As human beings, we do everything we can to soft sell life. Um, as a parent, I was raised in the generation that everybody gets a trophy. And as a parent that never did like that, I never could understand it. Your team won every game. Your trophy was about 15 to 16 inches tall. And it said first place. And the very next team that was also celebrating at the pizza parlor with you went 0 and 12. And they all got the same matching trophy as yours did, except yours said first place, and they said participation award. Nobody has any problems. Nobody succeeded. Nobody failed. There's a British singer right now called Rag and Bone. Not usually a guy that you're going to talk about in church. But he has, an, he has a song out called Human. And it simply says this, Maybe I'm foolish. Maybe I'm blind. Thinking I can see through this and what's behind. Got no way to prove it, so maybe I'm blind. But I'm only human after all. I'm only human. Don't put the blame on me. And so as he sings through each and every one of the verses, he simply comes to the conclusion, hey, I, I'm not at fault. I'm only human. And family, we live in a world that no one wants to be responsible. Now, I want to suggest to you today that's not the most loving thing that you can tell anybody. All right? Let me give you another scenario. I go to my doctor. And I go to my doctor and I say, hey, this thing's been growing over here on my cheek for the last couple of months. And he looks at me and says, ah, don't worry about it. Probably the sun. I said, yeah, but it's about an inch up. Don't worry about it. It's brown. Don't worry about it. I got this funny cough. Doesn't seem right. Eh, go home, take a throat lozenger, it's okay. You know, you're just fine, you're overreacting. Well, I don't want to go home from a guy like that. He's going to be nice to me, he's going to be sweet, he's going to be tender. You see, I want somebody to come in and go, Whoa, what's that on the side of your face? Let me test it. Uh, you got a funny cough. Let me take you through a battery of tests. And then I want that same doctor who's just taken me through that battery of tests to sit down with me. And he said, Mr. Slusher, I have some bad news. You have lung cancer. And that lung cancer has metathesized. And... This is the only course of action that we have to really aggressively get what's going on with you. And we're going to begin immediately. And we're going to try to handle you with care and love and concern, but we have to aggressively go after this. Now, forgive me, but I don't want that guy as my doctor. I want this one. He let me know right up the bad news. And he tells me what it is, and he holds me accountable to what's going to happen. So I want you to hear Peter. Peter doesn't mince words. So let me pick a few verses. Verse 23. 
you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, Jesus Christ. Verse 37, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 38, repent and be baptized. Now, understand, repent implies in it you're going the wrong way and you're doing the wrong thing. All right? Go with me to the doctor again. And the doctor comes in and he says, hey, Pete, you're at the dawn of type 2 diabetes. Every man's allowed so many calories in life and you ate all yours about two years ago. And Pete, you can't behave this way. It's going to get worse. In essence, guys, the doctor just said, repent from your eating habits. I want you to go in a new direction, all right? Peter's saying the same thing, except the trust and the confidence and the sins of the crowd that's listening to him. Repent and be baptized. By being baptized to the, to the crowd there is no longer have confidence in the temple, no longer have confidence in the, the celebration of all of the, the ritual. Uh, you're going to reject it because you're going to be baptized and your confidence is going to be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he closes it all in verse 30, the forgiveness of your sins. Yes, there's a standard of behavior. You have, you have gone beyond that standard and we need to do something about it. And so, family, Peter comes to them and reminds them very strongly, not only are they sinners, but they are part and parcel of the group of people that murdered Jesus Christ. Now, I want to suggest to you today that most likely not everybody that's listening were also there six weeks earlier and saying, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be on our hands and the hands of our children. I don't think everybody was there saying that. And yet at the same time, Peter's holding them accountable. But that accountability is the same message that we have carried all throughout the history of the church. It was Rembrandt in the 1500s that could paint the painting of the crucifixion of Christ. And there as he paints it, he has the Roman guards all around the cross. And with rope and with pulling and pushing and prodding, they are pushing up Jesus Christ to drop him into the hole that will become the home for the stanchion of the cross. And right in the middle of all of these Roman guards, he paints this little 15th century painter with a blue beret. And out of sequence to history, and out of sequence to the moment, this little teeny man is also hands on the cross, pushing Jesus into place. Rembrandt painted himself into the painting. And he wants the world to know he's as guilty of putting Jesus on the cross as anyone did historically that day. His sin put him there. His sin was responsible. And Peter is doing the same thing in the moment because he's proclaiming our accountability for what Christ does and why he did it. And so family, it's very important for all of us that if we're going to ever explain the gospel, that the accountability that all of us, every man, woman, and child on the planet needs to recognize we put Christ there because of our sins. So file away your opportunity to proclaim We did it, and we have to admit it. Family, I also want you to see that God places our blame on Christ. Believe it. See, the reality of, of our life in sin can be pretty depressing. Can't it? Now, let me even make it worse for you, all right? 
You're all Christians. It's sunny and rosy and good in your world. I get that, right? Always good. Let, let's remove Christ for a moment. Let's remove the cross. Let's pretend for a moment that there is no sovereign God in absolute control of the earth. He's not designing the end according to his perfect love and his knowledge. There is no divine awareness. We're left with nothing more than happenstance. All right? Let's come to your life. And where you had trusted that someone was in control and someone was watching over you, and as Romans says, that God works everything together for good, let's remove that for a moment. And so not only do we have happenstance in the situations of the earth, but we have nothing but chance in your life. And now, let's interject guilt. Because you already have despair, but guilt because of sin. But here's the problem. Who designed sin? Since there is nothing to design right and wrong, chance and happenstance have all left us with where we're at. And now what we're left with is, is this people's opinion and this people's opinion and this people's opinion and this people's opinion. And we're all now fighting for what opinion's right and it gets even more depressing. Doesn't it? And you watch a world right now go out of its mind in disorder. Family, John 14, 6 can tell us that Jesus takes that control that's lacking and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man walks to the Father but by me. And so he gives you and I confidence of that truth, and he places it clearly on himself. I am, I am, I am your purpose, your reality, your meaning. Now, that becomes very, very important because he singularly now has importance in our lives. So now you and I have absolute trust in the person of Jesus Christ. Walk with me this morning to Palestine. If you will, let me come to a, a small little shop in Ramallah. And there a spiritual leader is talking to a group of teenage boys. And one of the little teenage boys is heavily influenced. And as he listens to that spiritual leader, he decides that he's right and he puts on that jacket. That's a one-way jacket that's filled with ball bearings, nails, and plastic explosives. And the little boy, believing everything that his spiritual leader taught him, goes in and hits the detonator in a Jewish delicatessen, blowing everyone in there up because he believes the moment he took his life, he gets eternity. He gets unknown joy. He gets opportunity beyond anything that this life would offer him. And he says, I have confidence in that. You have confidence in Jesus Christ. What's the difference? Peter looks out that day and he says, wait a second, guys. I want to show you the validity that you can stand on. I want to give you some confidence. And so to that crowd, he gives them a fourfold understanding. And he says, first, in verse 22, he says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. So for this crowd, as he spoke, he says, hey guys, hey, let's go back six weeks earlier. There's a lot of you in this crowd who were, who were there when he fed 5,000. You remember that? Oh yeah, I was sitting in that crowd. I can't believe how much I ate. And he did that all from a happy meal. Oh, I remember it. Some of them were there when Bartimaeus got his sight back. Oh, yeah, nobody could take that blind guy and let him see. And some of them were there when Lazarus walked out of the tomb. Oh, yeah, I remember the aftershave that he had. Whoa! 
and he came out alive. I remember that. And so we're reminded this, this morning, Peter goes right back and he says, guys, wait a second, nobody does that unless they have greater claim than just mere manhood. He comes down and he says, not only is it by signs and wonders, but he did so by divine appointment. Verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Now that might not play in the 20th, 21st century, but to a group of Jews in that moment, in that time, who were there for one reason, the celebration of the festival of Pentecost, to be reminded that they were in the hands of a, of a God who, who knew, who planned, and moved through humanity and, and history to bring us this moment in time, they would have known that's this Jesus. He comes thirdly, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it is not possible for him to be held by it. And family, it's the resurrection of the Christ that comes all the way through the history of Christianity so that when we look down and begin to talk about believe it and to have trust in the Savior God, it's the resurrection that holds us the absolute promise. And beginning with, beginning with Peter, including today, we're reminded with no resurrection, there is no confidence. We are here today. We worship today. We attend today. We're loyal to one another today because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And on that, we find great claim. Peter took them to one more place. He took them back to the Old Testament, specifically King David. And King David would have been given the promise of the coming Messiah. And in the coming Messiah, they would have looked and seen in Jesus Christ so that Peter could preach and say for David says concerning him you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption and he goes back a thousand years in history to remind them that the crucifixion and the resurrection were real and planned by a sovereign God who's in control and so family you're left with the opportunity of evidential thinking to respond to. And when you take someone to admit that they're a sinner, you take them to the only one who by his substitutionary death on the cross can make things right. And family, what a key verse Romans 3.23 becomes for the wages of sin is death I'm sorry, that's 623. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let me take you to heaven for a moment without the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Imagine you and I could get there somehow. All right? We're now standing before God. Let me ask you an honest question. Do you think a human in humanness could stand before the justice of God? God's pure ability to determine right from wrong. Do you really think a human could stand before him? Do you really think a human could stand before the goodness of God? Do you really think ultimately that a human being could stand before the holiness of God? Someone who is so absolutely holy that he can tell you about his character not as if it was braggadocio, but knowing that if you knew him that well, you would be blessed. Do you really think a human being could stand before that God? So the substitute gives us his righteousness so that we can stand before that God. He holds us accountable, admit it. God gives us, or God places our blame on Christ. He's the substitute Believe it. And so we're given a plan of attack that goes all the way back to Pentecost that day to be witnesses, to follow the King of Kings. And I want you to notice he leaves us with the third of the ABCs. God brings a new life. Choose it. 
your forgiveness, the impact that infects your family, the gift of the Holy Spirit, all of it is based on an accountability that's on you. So Peter could say, save yourself from this crooked generation. And family, uh, one of the things that you will always have to talk to anyone when you talk to an individual about their, the gift of salvation is a sense of expectation. You see, if a, person, if a person has cancer, they have to put their trust in something. They have to choose the plan of attack they're going to do. So again, let me come back to the doctor's office for a moment. And the doctor begins to tell me about my cancer. I have lung cancer. That lung cancer is metathesized and it shows it in my skin. And we're going to have to go for a very aggressive plan of attack to root this out of your body. And I look down and say, wow, that's really, really cool information. I think I'll go watch the duck game. All right? And I just leave it there. Understand, I'm going to die of lung cancer. It demanded that I choose the plan of attack that the doctor has to set before me. You and I look down and we have to remind people of the same thing. You see, it's a, it's a great lesson in history to find out that Jesus died on the cross for sins. It's a great moral and ethical play that we could look down and see our unworthiness. But there's a responsibility that says, wow, because he did that and because I am that, I choose the redemption that he gives me. And so we're given that opportunity, that really incredible privilege to communicate to others the opportunity that can change their lives and free them. And the message of the cross always comes with a sense of urgency. Always. For them, they were worried about the coming day of the Lord. Now, we've been around for 21 centuries. We know, wow, it, it didn't come yet. And to some of us, that's one of the hindrances. Well, is his, is his word really worth it? Well, the gospel always comes with urgency. Here's why. You don't know tomorrow. You don't know tomorrow. You don't know every stop sign that you will go through and you don't know that you can rely on every individual going through every stop sign with you. You don't know what tomorrow and the visit to the doctor is going to communicate to you. You don't know that family outing that could turn tragic because you only had three life rafts, or excuse me, life vests, and you had five people. You don't know. And the other killer is this. We can grow hard in our hearts. Uh, Hebrews says it this way in verse four, or chapter four, verse seven. Today, if you hear with your voice, do not hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let me go back to my, my doctor for a moment. Pete, you have type two diabetes. You gotta lose a little weight. You know, Doc, you know, I got invited out tonight after church, and you, you should see the chocolate pie that they make. Whoa. I'm having three pieces. You're not telling me anything today. I'll wait till tomorrow. Oh, do you know that family just brought homemade pizza over to us? I'll set the salad aside. Give me all that pizza. You know, I've already gone two days. Might as well wait till the first of the month. You know, my pants are fitting okay. I'll just buy a larger pair when the next time I need it. And I go on, and I go on, and I go on. Why? Because I haven't seen the, the sense of urgency. There is nothing there. But God says, hey, wait a second. You don't know tomorrow. And if you don't do well on a decision that's easy to see in this life, what happens to an eternal one? Choose wisely now. And so family, because you and I don't know tomorrow, we simply remind people that they have the privilege to choose the gift of salvation. And I want you to understand, Peter did that day. Peter spoke out to them 
and said, save yourselves. And you know what's amazing? On a party day, on a day that they should have had a good time, on a day that should have been very family friendly and filled with incredible memories, 3,000 people heard him and changed their lives. That's the privilege that you and I have. We get to communicate that same great story, never knowing the moment, never knowing the incidents that God will use by just being faithful. Father in heaven, allow us the privilege to see what you've designed in us being believers. We get to be your witnesses. And so, Father, I would ask that you would watch over and allow us to take on that strategic reality that we were given the privilege of salvation, that we may take the gift of salvation to others. And so, dear God in heaven, I would pray that you would allow us to see, pray for, and take opportunity to see others find the great and precious Savior that we know and love. In Jesus' name, amen.